Hello and a very warm welcome to a new show and a new political era. Tomorrow, one of these two will be chosen as our new Prime Minister. I promise that on this programme we'll bring you good news along with the bad. But whoever wins faces an almighty job. It's not been a pretty race. No new taxes. Maxing out the country's credit card is not right. But the victor has enormous problems to confront. Energy prices making life impossible. I think it's a terrifying winter ahead for everybody. The war here in Ukraine, one of the big reasons for the problems we face. Putin's already shut down a major pipeline. The squeeze is on. So there's one big question for us this morning. What should the next Prime Minister do first? Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak are both here. And we'll hear from Elena Zelenska, the First Lady of Ukraine, about her fears, the path of the war and Eurovision. And with me throughout the show to chew it all over, Cleo Watson, who worked for Boris Johnson and Theresa May in number 10, Birmingham's finest, the comedian Joe Lysett. Hello. And the Labour frontbencher, Emily Thornbury. A very warm welcome to you. Now, first, a quick word about our show. We are here to ask important questions, the ones that you want answers to from the people who make decisions that affect us all. We will check out what is true and what is not, but we're going to try and have more conversations than arguments. Now, I cannot promise you that's always what's going to happen, but we will also sometimes have a bit of fun, including this morning, I hope. I'm very glad you're here. Right, let's get cracking because there's really one thing on people's minds at the moment. And in the last couple of days, social media has shown just how tough the next few months is going to be for people. Families and firms have been sharing their bills online and with us. Look at the energy bill of one small restaurant going from £2,900 a year to 22000 Now, in a way, that's the thing this morning that gets to the heart of the problems the new prime minister has. But if you look at the front pages, well, you might not realise we're on the verge of a huge political moment tomorrow. Some of them are talking about the prime ministerial race, but not them all. But first, of course, as a politics programme, that's what we're going to discuss. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. Now, Clear Watson, you know the Tory party well. You've worked in government. Tell us something that we don't know about both of them. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Um, I think something very interesting about Rishi is he has his reputation as a very clean liver, he doesn't uh, drink, he doesn't eat meat, but he has an unbelievable sweet tooth, <laughs> which seems a bit sort of against the grain for him. Liz I don't know so well personally, but I think something quite interesting about her is she's been on and off in the cabinet since 2014, mm. and that's a lot of kind of in-party fighting for that period, so she's a real survivor. I think it speaks to a kind of cunning that people might underestimate about her. Very interesting. Well, it mm. certainly looks this summer like people at the beginning underestimated her. I mean, Jo Lysett, um, you were a keen political observer, although you say you're not on the left or the right, but what have you made of the contest this summer? And what do you want to hear of this morning? Well, I think it's been a great use of our resources, a great use of the media to have a, a sort of infighting in, in a Tory party when there's a huge cost of living crisis coming. Do I detect a bit of cynicism there? No, not from me. <laughs> course, surely not. Um, I would like to just hear the truth. OK, well, Emily Thornbury used to go up against Liz Truss very often as her opposite number in the House of Commons. What was her strongest characteristic? She's very thick-skinned. Uh, but I think her weakest characteristic is that she just isn't somebody who's into detail and, uh, and in that way can be quite lightweight and can be caught out. Okay. So, well, Bear we'll that be, in mind, Laura. Well, we'll be pressing her on some of that detail. <laughs> I think you've just set me a challenge there, Emily Thornbury. <laughs> a reminder, later in the programme, we'll be looking at some extraordinary pictures from the troubles of NASA's new Artemis moon rocket. Sadly, it failed to take off again yesterday. So what is next for humankind's next mission to the moon? And we'll be talking about this, something extraordinary. Now, 
Now, last night at Wembley, there was a huge concert, a tribute to Taylor Hawkins, who was the drummer in the Foo Fighters. That was his son, Shane, playing at the concert in memory of his dad. Any of you Foo Fighters fans, very quickly? Yeah. Joe nodding it's away. It's very you moving to see that, that Shane Hawkins playing. It's an amazing concert, yeah. OK, well, we'll talk a bit Rock more. Rock royalty. Absolutely. Something from the generations. Paul McCartney, Brian May, all sorts of people there. Now, thank you all for now. Stay with me, because you've got plenty more work to do. Now, Liz Truss is very much the bookie's favourite to be announced tomorrow as the 56th Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. She's gone from being a student Lib Dem activist to a Tory cabinet minister and now on the verge of the biggest job in the business. And I'm delighted to say that she's here with us this morning. Thank you so much. Good morning, much Laura. Great to be in. here. Yeah, we're delighted to have you here. Now, the ballot is closed, so nothing you say in the next 15 minutes is going to affect the result. But unless every single political crystal ball in the country is wrong, you are about to become Prime Minister. Can you believe it? Well, first of all, we don't have the result yet. And I'm not complacent. Anything can happen. I always think it's very unwise to predict the future. But I am ready if I am selected to be our Prime Minister. Well, you're likely to move in. That's what everybody is expecting at a very hard time. Do you think that we are at a crisis point in this country? I think we face some very, very serious challenges. We have the appalling war in Ukraine perpetrated by Putin. We still have the aftermath of COVID, which was a massive economic shock. And we're also facing a severe energy crisis as well. So I'm in no... I'm under no illusions mm. about how difficult it is. So we are. But as, a, but as a country, we have faced tough challenges before and we've got through those challenges. And I'm absolutely confident that we have the wherewithal, the ability to be able to deal with these challenges. I don't think you know, we should be predicting a sort of Armageddon scenario. I think we are in a good position to deal with what are very, very tough challenges. But do you accept we are at a crisis point in this country with so many challenges on different fronts? Well, I absolutely accept that we face very, very serious challenges, which will take immediate action from well, let's, the government. Well, let's talk about that. So you started your leadership campaign saying that there wouldn't be any handouts for people worried about energy bills, but things have changed. You're now promising, as you just have done, immediate action. Are you going to give people money to help pay their energy bills? What I've always said during this campaign is we have a serious issue of energy. The reality is, is that we haven't done as much as we should have done as a country to protect our energy security. We've become dependent on the world market. And as a collective, Europe has become dependent on Russia, and that's a huge problem. So what I have said is as well as lowering taxes, my first port of call will be sorting out supply. Because at the moment, we're still not doing enough to use our resources in the North Sea. We need to move ahead we'll faster with nuclear, and we we'll need to, to find more reliable sources of supply. And we will come to your long-term plans because that's a really important issue. But I think a lot of people watching this morning want to know what you are going to do now. We've seen some of the bills that are landing on people's doormats now. Eye-watering, impossible. Will you, if you're in government, give people money to help pay their bills? I understand that people are struggling with eye-watering energy bills. And there are predictions of even worse down the track. But and I, I understand that. And I can say, Laura, that I will act if I'm elected as Prime Minister. I will act immediately on bills and on energy supply because I think those two things go hand in hand. We need to deal with the immediate problem. Mm -hmm. We need to help people. We need to help businesses. But we also need to sort out the supply issues and that have ended up made us end up being where we are and, now. And we will talk about those long-term issues, but you've just said you will act immediately to help people with their bills. In what form? Through universal credit, the benefit system, or some kinds of flat payments? What I can say is that if I'm elected as Prime Minister, within one week, I will make sure there is an announcement on how we are going to deal with the issue of energy bills and of long-term supply to put this country on the right footing for winter. So within a that week, is absolutely a vital. And I understand that people are struggling 
that businesses are also concerned about their energy bills mm -hmm. and the impact it could have on their future. So what I want to reassure people is I will act if elected as prime minister within one week. Now, what I can't do, Laura, on this show <laughs> is tell you exactly what that announcement would be. You know, we still don't know the outcome of this leadership contest. Well, I think so I mean, the ballot, be, it the ballot would be shut completely list, wrong. Well, and, and well, you're promising are... immediate action, but not telling us what that action would be. Well, I mean, you, you must know what, what you're planning to do. There are some suggestions this morning that you will unveil a £100 billion package in order to help with energy. Is that the right kind of ballpark? Look, you know, as an experienced political commentator, that before you have been elected as prime minister, you don't have all the wherewithal to get the things done. So this is why it will take a week to sort out you know, the precise plans and make sure we are able to announce them. And, 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 and that is why I cannot go into details at this stage. And it would I be wrong. That. And I but what I want that. to be very clear about with the public is I understand that this is a huge problem. Just, just, and I understand people are worried. And I want to reassure people that I am absolutely determined to sort out this issue, as well as, within a month, present a full plan for how we are going to reduce taxes, how we're going to get the and British we, and economy going, and, and how we are going to and we will, find our way out of these very difficult times. And we will talk about that long-term plan in a second, but very briefly, would you reject the idea of freezing energy bills as Labour has suggested? That's a yes or no question on principle. It, I'm not going to go into details okay. of what of what a okay. putative announcement would be before, because I think it would be you, wrong so to do that. So you're not ruling out a freeze, before. or are you just being coy? I'm not. I'm not being <laughs> coy. What I've been very clear about is that I would act immediately within a week. Mm -hmm. I understand what people are facing on energy bills. <laughs> this is vital for people. It's vital for yeah. our economy we sort this problem out. So let's talk but what about, I'm not going to do is, and, I've, I've, and you've asked the same question in a variety of ways to mm -hmm. try and winkle and out. I've, and I've heard that loud <laughs> and clear, and I'm trying to get the, the answers that the audience wants to hear, but they have to wait another few days, that, and that's fair enough. Let's talk about something you have talked about extensively, your tax cuts. Now, you want to reverse the national insurance rise. But let's take a look at what that would mean. So if we can put our graphic up on the screen here, the poorest would stand to gain about seven pounds from that. At the top of the income bracket, wealthiest people in the country would gain 900, maybe even nearly 2,000 pounds. Is that fair? Well, the people at the top of the income distribution pay more tax. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, when you cut taxes, mm -hmm. you tend to benefit people who are more likely to pay tax. Of course, there are some people who don't pay tax at, at all. all. Mm -hmm. But to look at everything through the lens of redistribution, I believe is wrong. Because but what I'm about is about growing the economy. And growing the economy benefits everybody. But you're happy but with... This, but this, this is a really important point, because so far, the economic debate for the past 20 years has been dominated by discussions about distribution. But and what's happened mm -hmm. is we have had relatively low growth. So we've had no more than an average of 1% growth, and that has been holding our country but back. And it means... But before we get into a debate about economic that, theory, this, this is, is one of the things that you've promised clearly. You want to do it. Absolutely. You believe it's the right thing. I do believe it, it's right. But is it fair that on this yes, decision... Yes, it is be, fair. It is fair yes, to give the wealthiest fair. people more money back. It is fair. We promised in our manifesto that we would not raise national insurance. I opposed the decision to raise it in Cabinet because it was the wrong decision. I believe it is the you right thing. It, you could have quit if you felt that strongly. Well, I could, but I preferred to stay in and fight my corner because I'm not somebody who quits. I'm somebody who gets the job done. I make my case. I was a loyal cabinet minister to Boris Johnson. I didn't agree with the decision, but I accepted it was a collective decision. But the point I'm making, Laura, is that was a decision that we said we wouldn't do in our manifesto. I will reverse that decision. And of course, the decision was to put tax... But it's an expensive thing to do. So you've explained why you think it's the right thing. Um, but it's expensive. 
it'll be about £13 billion to do that. And we've got our calculator out to have a look at everything else that you've promised during this campaign. Um, £17 billion is the projected cost of cancelling the rise in taxes on big business. You've promised what would look like an extra £150 billion or so on defence by the end of the decade. Where on earth is that going to come from? Because you want to so cut taxes and spend more. You just talked about corporation tax, Laura. So this is about not raising a tax. Last time we cut corporation tax, mm -hmm. we saw the revenues increase. So I don't agree mm -hmm. with the proposition that th this is static, that it's just a certain amount of money will come into the exchequer. But more broadly, if we raise corporation, very big checks. If we raise corporation tax to the same level as France and 10 points higher than Ireland, it's going to be harder for us to get the investment. It's going to be harder for us to get the jobs and growth. But you can't be confident and today that by cutting corporation tax, that's going to somehow come up with that amount of money for all of the things that you've promised but, to But spend. what I can be confident about is that having lower corporation tax will attract more business and more investment into the UK. it hasn't really into done the for the, the last UK, 10 years. I mean, that's what George Osborne UK. did. And, but but for, forgive me, George Osborne did that. And actually, if you look at the last 10 years of growth in this country, it's been pretty anemic. So you can't be confident. You might think it's the right thing to do, but it's a gamble. No, well, what I know is that putting up tax on business is not going to attract more businesses to invest in this country. And you're right, Laura, we have had relatively low mm. growth which is why we need to do more. We need to build roads faster. We need to get on with building power stations and reservoirs. We need to make Britain work. And I'm determined to take the tough decisions to move all of that forward. So we need to do more. But what I'm saying is that putting up corporation tax mm -hmm. will be completely self-defeating. And, and this is a really important point. And mm -hmm. It relates back to the point you were making about redistribution. Mm -hmm. That if we have a low growth economy, which we've had for the past two decades. And if we don't go get growth up, which I believe is vitally important, we won't have the money to spend on but the NHS. We won't have the money and, and in I mean, people's pockets. But if and you're what wrong I care about, about is I care about people having opportunities, people having good jobs, mm -hmm. people having high and wages. And people are struggling That at is the moment. why I want to do this. And, but if you're wrong, and what happens actually is that inflation keeps going up, People are already experiencing hardship due to inflation being going up and up. There are some projections now that it might even go up to 18%, maybe even 22%, according to Goldman Sachs. Is it your job to stop it getting that high, and do you think it might? It's the job of the Bank of England to bring inflation down. And I'm a great believer in the independence of the Bank of England. We need to allow the Bank of England to do that job. And now, are, they, and are you happy with them inflation. raising interest rates to stop that happening? Because that's their lever. That's the one they're going to pull. Are you happy well, with interest it. rates going up? I think it was about three decades ago we stopped politicians making decisions about interest rates. So I'm not going to start saying what interest rates the Bank of England should be should be setting. But would you be relaxed if interest rates go up quite significantly? Because that means it's harder for young people to buy houses, rents go up, all sorts of things happen, people's mortgages get more expensive. I think it would be completely wrong for me as a politician to say what I wanted interest rates to be and to countermand the Bank of England. But just on the inflation point, mm -hmm. inflation is projected to peak. So we do know inflation will come down. Now of course, we need to do all we can to help people in the meantime. I've talked about how I take immediate mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. on energy to help people with bills. You know, and, reversing and the tax rise is important on that as well, because well, it's making sure people are keeping more money in their own and pockets. And let's go, let's go back to energy, because I know you want to talk about the long term, and, and so do we. What do you do if Putin turns off the gas this winter? Well... We actually, as a country, rely relatively little on ga gas from Russia. But of but course, you know, Europe, goes up. Europe do uh, rely on it significantly. He, this is what he has done. He has tried to build up leverage by making Europe dependent on Russian gas. So what will we do must, First of all, worse? we must never, ever get in that same position again. And this is why it's important that we develop renewables, we develop nuclear that we work with our European partners to develop alternative forms of energy. It's also very important we use the resources in the North Sea. There's more we can do to exploit current gas fields. I support exploring fracking mm -hmm. in parts of the United Kingdom uh, where that can be done. There's very little evidence, though, that that could 
quickly make a big difference. And there's lots of evidence that local communities don't want fracking. Well, all of these things add up. And it's also about more offshore wind. It's about moving faster on all of those projects and also securing more supply. And what about solar? I mean, do you wish you hadn't said that solar panels are one of the worst sites in the English countryside? I mean, you say you want renewables So there. I support solar on commercial roofs. And what I would do is make it easier to put solar panels on the roofs of warehouses, on factories, on homes. But what we shouldn't be doing is putting solar panels on productive agricultural land because as well as an energy security issue, we face a food security issue. And I'm a great believer in producing more of our own food but in the think, United Kingdom and using our using our fields for but that. But it's interesting also, you know, you're talking about shale, you're talking about more activity in the North Sea. Is this a retreat from something that Boris Johnson promised a lot and talked a lot about of, is moving much quickly on renewables, being firmly committed to cutting emissions and sticking to net zero? Are you reach retreating so from I'm that? So I'm very supportive of renewables and I want us to do more on hydrogen, mm -hmm. more on wind power, mm -hmm. more on solar power, provided it's yeah, in the right... Yeah, you're talking about more exploration in the, right in the North place. Sea and we shale. We need to do that. both. We need but to do our that. priority has to be energy security. And I will make sure that we do hit our net zero targets, but we need to do it in, in a way that protects energy security. And gas is a very important transition fuel. Gas has half the emissions of coal. You know, it is a good fuel to use as we're transitioning to net zero. And one of the other big problems that you will have to deal with this winter, if you're lucky enough to get to number 10, is what's happening in the health service. Mm. Now, as things stand, by the next election, the NHS will make up more than 40% of day-to-day -day spending. Mm. Can we go on like that? Look, I'm completely committed to the budget we've set out for the National Health Service, but we do face real issues on the ground difficulty in getting GP appointments, mm -hmm. difficulty in getting an NHS dentist, waiting times for ambulances are far too long. So what I would do is appoint a health secretary who could tackle those issues on the ground. But and in to the me, longer term, I mean, is it sustainable for that amount of money to keep going into the health service? It's such a huge slice of the national pie. Well, I think it is a priority for the public and it's a priority for me to make sure we're delivering for people. But there are, there are real issues in the health service at the moment there are, in the aftermath of COVID yeah. because you've got a backlog of operations. So there are real issues that and we've got are, to deal with. And are people going to see waiting times come down? Are people going to get the care that they're waiting for? Yes. And what I would, would ask my health secretary to do is set out a clear plan of how we're going to achieve that. But I think one of my key priorities would be primary care. OK. And GP Let's appointments because that is absolutely critical right, and very difficult at the moment. So a huge amount in your entry if you make it to number 10. But let's talk a bit about the kind of prime minister that you would like to be. Now, like any politician, you've had your fair share of criticism over the years. Sometimes maybe people have been a bit rude about your speeches when you mentioned cheese or pork markets or smirking when you posed for pictures very much in the style of Margaret Thatcher. We can have a look at that, I think, in the screen. I, now, I might not look at You this. can't <laughs> have done that by accident, Liz Truss. I mean, when, when people have sometimes, you know, poked a bit of fun at your political character, but actually you've beaten them all, haven't you? You've outwitted your critics. No, I, I am focused on getting the job done. And that's what I've done in every role that I've taken on. Uh, that picture when I'm in a tank is I'm on the border in Estonia, working with our allies to deal with Russian aggression. And that is a priority for me. And in every job I've done, mm -hmm. you know, I might not have presented myself in the slickest way. I might have made some speeches that some people have taken the mick out of. But you've used but that in to every advantage, job, though, haven't you? In every job, I've got on with getting the job done. And I think that's what the public want to see, Laura. I well, think they want that... to see somebody who's committed to making things better. And that's, that's what I'm committed to doing. But will we see... And I spend 100% of my effort but, on that. And I don't worry too much about the various brick bats I might get from but, some well, of my well, critics. Well, sometimes it seems like you enjoy it a bit and sometimes your style's <laughs> maybe been a bit cavalier. I mean, you said we should ignore Nicola Sturgeon. You joked you weren't sure if Emmanuel Macron was friend or foe. Nicola Sturgeon has actually said back at you this morning, if she governs like she campaigned, it'll be a, a disaster. But are, are we going to see a different Liz Truss in number 10 if you get the job? Well, with me, what you see is what you get. I am a person who, I don't make promises I can't keep. I follow through uh, on what I say I'll do. 
and you know I've been asked to Syria well you know this has probably been one of the longest job interviews in history the last <laughs> sort of 10 weeks I've been asked all kinds of questions about you know issues domestic international and I've given frank answers about what I think well let's have a, a last frank answer if you do win there's a set of nightmares that confront you I think the most profound set of problems for any prime minister in, that I can remember Boris Johnson always told everybody, told the country everything was going to be fine, but it ended badly for him and it ended quickly. How will you make sure that doesn't happen to you? Well, first of all, I will be clear with the public about what we are going to face. And there will be challenging circumstances. There'll be difficult decisions to be made. And not all of those decisions will be popular, but I will be honest about what we will have to do. But I'm also somebody who is positive and I'm clear that we can deal with these issues. Okay. That Britain has been through worse, frankly, in the past. And we have the capability, we have the attitude and we have the spirit and, and, to deal with the and challenges we may well, we And we may well have Liz Truss in number 10 on Tuesday. Thank you so much for coming Thank in. You. And whatever happens, Thank do you. come back. Well, I was going to say, it, going for some reaction from our panel, because listening to that interview at the desk and seeming to applaud Joe Lysett, the comedian, Cleo Watson, who has lots and lots of experience in number 10, because she worked for Theresa May and Boris Johnson. Now, Joe, I'm going to let you calm down a bit before I ask you what you thought I of love it. it. Um, well done, Liz. <laughs> Cleo, what did you make of that? I mean, Liz Truss has campaigned in a way that has tickled the Tory party, mm. but what did you think of what she was trying to say to the country? I mean, I still think the key question that you asked that, that, that she dodged best of all was what happens if Putin really does turn the gas supplies off this winter? And with everything we've seen in the last couple of days with Nord Stream 1, it's, it's perfectly likely. And so that, that real sense of what's happening in the short term, away from fracking and North Sea and so on, mm -hmm. we need an answer. And I think she's going to have to answer that sooner rather than later. You're absolutely right about kind of pivoting from, you know, she, she said what you see is what you get and, and uh, Sturgeon's comment about, I hope she doesn't govern about, uh, I, I hope she doesn't govern the way she's campaigned. Mm. And it's quite an important pivot. She's mm. gonna have to very quickly win over the public. That's a very different beast to the Conservative Party. Party. She's understood that audience perfectly. You know, she still has her party conference speech at the beginning mm -hmm. of next month. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, she very, very quickly has to win hearts and minds of, of us Brits. Now, Joe, what did you make of it? Now, have you calmed down? She has to go I'm from not, the I'm... campaign to the country. But tell us honestly what you thought. Well, so uh, you said earlier that I'm not left or right. I'm actually, I know that there's been criticism in the, uh, the Mail on Sunday today about lefty, liberal, wokey comedians on the BBC. I'm actually very right wing and I loved it. I thought she was very clear. She gave great, clear answers. I know exactly what she's up to. And I think she's uh, most people watching at home who are worried about their bills are going to feel. Point, Joe. Forgive me. There's a I'm serious point. I'm not being sarcastic. She said that there was a big package of help coming this week yeah. for people to help. She was pay very their clear bills. what she said, and I, I, I think you know exactly what's going to happen. I think you're reassured. I'm reassured. Are you reassured? Well, Emily Thornberry, so reassured. you're smirking over there in the corner. I'm I mean, trying not to smirk. I mean, it's 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 extraordinary that we've had a leadership election that has gone on for weeks and weeks, as, as you know, as everyone has been saying. And yet the two leadership candidates, Liz Trust, you've just heard from, cannot give a specific answer to the one question, frankly, that everybody wants an answer to, yeah. which is what the heck is going to happen to my bills? What, am I, what is going to happen? And it isn't just... She's going to sort it. It isn't just, and, it yeah, isn't and, just the poorest. It's people in middle incomes as well. Mm -hmm. it's going to, we're going to have the majority of the country in fuel poverty unless something is done. I'm, and what she says is, oh, well, I can't possibly tell you I'll tell you in a week. And yet, Why not? Emily Thornberry, and yet, Emily Thornberry, is it not possible that actually, there's some suggestions this morning, that she might come forward with a £100 billion package for people? Is it possible that then she will answer the calls that Labour's been making all and summer? And who is she going to give that money to? Will it be money that will go to everybody? Will it be targeted? How will it happen? How will they do it fast? Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you know, it is, it is incumbent on the Tory party. They are in government at the moment, mm -hmm. and people are desperate. They don't know... They're I heard, I heard yesterday from a woman whose rent, whose, whose rent is going to be less than her fuel bills. And she just has had to cancel her direct debit and she doesn't know what's going to happen next. And you get this. Cleo, one of the things that Liz Truss did say is that in her view, when it comes to the national insurance tax cut, it is fair that people at the top get more back. 
Now, how do you think people will hear that? It might please some people in the Tory party, but how do you think many of the public will feel about hearing that comment? Well, I mean, your graph is pretty damning. I think what's very difficult with this is making concrete promises one way or another. You know, she's, she's ruled out any tax, tax rises. She's, in fact, promised tax cuts. She's not looking at um, a windfall tax, for example, which potentially will get inevitable at some mm. point. I think the difficulty for the new prime minister and where the rubber really hits the road is you have your new plans, you have your new announcements, but it's how the public receive them. And it's not, you know, obviously the opposition will say this is a a U-turn inevitably, but sometimes public clamour is the way it is. And in my experience, you just have to... That happened when you were in government. Yeah, public, and you, and you the have... The public to... goes and then you follow. Exactly. Well, interestingly, more widely, the consensus in the press this morning is that the in-tray is a bit of a nightmare. They have a look at the Sunday Times describing it this morning. But there are different versions of what is going on inside the Tory party. Now, look at these two front pages. You have the Sunday Express carries a plea from Boris Johnson for unity, telling his colleagues to stop fighting and back the new prime minister. But, shock horror, if you follow politics, the Mirror is suggesting that some Tory MPs are already preparing to send in letters of no confidence in the new Prime Minister. Now, um, Emily Thornberry, what do you think is actually going to happen? If the Tories manage to patch it up under Liz Truss, well, it might make things hard for you. For the sake of the country, I do want to have a government that is going to be able to make difficult decisions and move our country on. And we can't have two years of chaos. But I am concerned that the Conservative Party has moved so far, so fast over the last few years under Boris Johnson. It isn't a Conservative Party that you would recognise, you know, 10 years ago. And I don't think that it is a, one which is about one nation. I do think it's become very right wing. And I think the possibilities of division and fighting are definitely there. I think the only way to get a fresh start is to have a Labour government. Obviously, well, you would, I do. you would say that, but obviously. I mean, but, but yeah. I mean, Cleo Watson, you're actually writing a book about your about what happens in Westminster fiction. We should say. Yes. But what is it about the Tory Party in recent years that seems to be sort of addicted to psychodrama? Can they leave yeah. it behind and get on with the job? I, I mean, I think uh, politics in general just is dramatic. There's always something going on, even in sort of quote unquote quieter times. I mean, one of the things that really struck me about the Mirror front page is, you know, whoever becomes Prime Minister next, if there are these rumblings that Boris Johnson is considering a comeback, mm. you know, party management is going to be really, really difficult. I said earlier that, you know, whoever it is will need to pivot from winning the hearts and minds of Tory members to the public at large. It's very difficult to do that if you've got your own MPs mm. slightly holding on to this backbench beast. But, Joe, politics can be very, very unpredictable. I mean, mm. let's look at two different opinions in the papers this yes. morning. You have a columnist, um, Matthew Syed, who's basically predicting that it's going to be a nightmare and that the leadership contest has been out of touch with the country. But Janet Daly in The Telegraph says, look, Actually, Liz Truss is stronger than you think. If she gets cracking, yeah. gets out there, she might be Fair able to... to... Janet. I think, you know, the haters will say that you've had 12 years of the Tories and that we're sort of at the dregs of what they've got available and that Liz Truss is sort of like the backwash of the available MPs. I wouldn't say that because I'm incredibly right-wing, but some people might say that. But the consensus, though, in politics is often wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, it's often, it's often wrong, and we often don't know what is going to pan out. Yeah. Well, th as, as Liz said there, she said she would be wrong to predict the future, even though loads of people have predicted that we're going to have real issues with paying our energy bills. But, um, you know, I think she's right to just then just sort of basically say, well, let's not predict and see what happens next week. I okay. think she did the right thing there. Well, let's talk about something completely different, which has also been unpredictable. Take a look at this extraordinary machine. Sadly for space enthusiasts and NASA engineers, the Artemis moon rocket, there it is, has failed to take off yesterday yet again. If it's successful and it eventually gets people back on the moon, maybe it's one of the few things that the whole world will be able to celebrate. Emily, are you a fan of watching the space programme? Were you waiting for it to take off yesterday? I think it's a bit of a metaphor, isn't it, for sort of, you know, new... The world right now. New Tory leadership. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a Just very, very HFT cheeky energy. remark. But, but <laughs> are you interested in space? I mean, do you think it's something right now at this time that governments should be spending money on? Um, yes, I always do. 
I, mean, I think that we should be positive about the future and exploration and looking looking up into the stars has been something that well, we have done we since. This is what it looks will look like if it finally makes it. And uh, let's hope for Emily and for space fans mm -hmm. out there that that happens very, very soon. We'll be watching very carefully. And lastly, something positive that Emily was calling for there. The Foo Fighters played their first live gig last night since the death of their drummer, Taylor Hawkins. Dave Grohl got a bit teary as he talked about his former bandmate at the concert that was a tribute to him. But I want to show you again this extraordinary clip of Taylor's son, Shane. Well, a 15-year-old there, Cleo Watson, can you believe that kind of thing? It was a, m a magical event by all accounts. It, I mean, it's scary enough just sitting here with the four of you, so I can't imagine <laughs> performing at Wembley. But, you know, luckily, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak were there to warm up the, the crowd a couple of days ago to get everyone pumped. <laughs> okay, well, they've been in front of tens and tens of thousands of people over the summer pressing the flesh with Tory of activists. Right, thank you all very much for now. More work for you to do, so don't go away. Now... Elena Zelenska first met her husband when they were in school and they got married in 2003. But if you skip forward 20 years, she's the first lady of a country that is at war with Russian invaders. I went to Kyiv this week to meet Mrs Zelenska to talk about the war efforts, President Zelensky and her hopes for the future. The human dimension of this conflict is something that's hard to relay. In the past six months, we've been living in a changed, a different reality that's not normal life anymore. To say it was a shock for Ukrainians when we woke up on the February 24th is, well, to say nothing. Many people would tell you that they still live on February 24th. We try to make it look like a normal life. This is a war against people, against civilian people, not against the army. It's the war of destruction. They're trying to scare us, to use, well, the scorched land tactics and then grab depopulated towns and cities. But Ukrainians try to stay optimistic. We do not know how long we will have to hold the lines. We are like running a long-distance stretch and trying to kiss our kids, hug our loved ones and live on, if at all possible. Are you afraid? Oh yes, we all are. But you cannot be so scared as to not do anything. You can't be passive. It's not that frightening if you do something. And people keep doing things, and they try to do things that precipitate our victory. Of course we are sitting here under extremely tight security. You yourself are the number two target for the Russians. How do you live with that? If you keep thinking about it, you'll get paranoid. Well, I couldn't leave because, first, I don't want to. When you are in the eye of the storm, it's not as scary. Because when you are here, you understand that you are not alone, that you are together with other people. And then you have to set an example by staying. And I would say that the bravest stay, our men and women in the army, the volunteers, they deserve support. We have to support them. And I think that I would have been wrong if I had left. This would be unreasonable. And your husband stayed when Kiev was under attack. If he and you had made a different decision, do you think that Kiev would have fallen? Do you think the Russians would be in charge now? I have never believed that they would be able to seize Kiev. I have known how much our people are ready to resist. And Russians could see that, while every bush, every window was used to repel the attack, and everyone who could use weapons did it. I remember seeing images of your husband walking around the city to show the world that he was here, mm -hmm. that he hadn't gone. You're smiling, recalling that moment, but what, what went through your head, if I may ask, when you saw those images? Well, I wasn't surprised. Well, I knew that he would do that. I never doubted that he would. We've never spoken about this choice to stay or to go. I knew that he would. Did you always know that he could be the kind of leader that he's shown the world to be in the last six months. You, you always knew he had it in him. 
Well, I've known him for over 20 years. We met when he was still a teenager, and he never changed his basic values. He's the man I've always known. He wouldn't do anything else. And I was kind of insulted by the people who were surprised and told them. So you, you thought people didn't know him, really? Well, probably you're right. Do you see him now? I mean, when do you see him? You're living under this extraordinary pressure and obviously things are very dangerous for you. How often do you manage to see him? Well, not that often, quite rarely. Sometimes I see him round in his office, but we talk every day on the phone. I hope that this kind of forcible separation would make our marriage even stronger. Well, make our relations stronger, I do hope. But we can feel each other, so to speak, and support each other. And we know what every, each other is doing. And you are taking an increasingly public role. You went to the United States recently and spoke very passionately in Congress, asking for more support, more arms, more help from the West. Democracies have shown very strong support for Ukraine, but do you worry as things continue that that support could fade? What I can say is that support is not just a want, it's a matter of survival. You can feel, you can see that the world might tend to get tired of the war, get this war fatigue. We hear that energy is getting pricier, that life's getting pricier, but people should understand that that is not coming through the West's support to Ukraine, but through the actions of Russia. There is no comparison to the suffering of people here, but at home in the United Kingdom, as you acknowledge, people are facing very painful choices because of the soaring cost of energy that's going to make things very tough for people. What would you say to our viewers watching at home who feel desperately sorry for what's happening to your people, but also who feel desperately worried about their own ability to pay the bills, to keep a roof over their head? What would you say to them? Well, of course, I understand the situation is very tough, but let me recall that at the time of the COVID-19 epidemic, and it's still with us, when there were price hikes, Ukraine is affected as well. The prices are going up in Ukraine as well. But in addition, our people get killed. So when you start counting pennies on your bank account or in your pocket, we do the same and count our casualties. These days, a woman was killed walking in a park in Kharkiv. Many people were injured. If the support is strong, this period will be shorter. There is a different cost, though, for people around Europe. Boris Johnson, who I'll ask you about in a moment, was here recently, and he said, Ukrainians are paying in blood, but people at home are having to pay too. Asking people to understand, I suppose. <laughs> You can't expect anyone else to understand. Well, partially maybe. That is why I keep saying that everywhere I go, trying to retell just human stories. I'm for one sure that everyone watched the video back in March of a little kid who was all in tears at the Ukrainian-Polish border. He had to walk for many miles with a knapsack on his back. And I think that fathers and mothers watching this video could not but break into tears. I always place myself in their situation, and I think that everyone, every human in the world should feel the same. That's why we have to tell these stories, to show these stories, because these are the faces of a war, not a number of bombs dropped, not the amount of money spent, human touch stories, and there are a thousand stories like that around. And you can't look away from that. You also have your own family. Your daughter, I believe, is about to start university. Yeah. Your son, I read, now wants to be a soldier. How do you feel about that? Are you proud of him or fearful for what that might mean? You know, every boy in Ukraine, I'd say, would like to be a soldier. And this is normal reaction. You won't talk him into choosing any other occupation. Before the war, the full-scale war was started, he was attending a dance group. Once I tried to resume this hobby and he said, no time for that, I don't want to dance, I want to learn to fight for my country. 
Some people even say that it is the time when the Ukrainian nation is being reborn because we see our belonging to this country, national identity, differently. And the kids show it better than the adults. There has been heavy fighting as Ukraine is trying to take territory back around Kherson. I mean, at the beginning of this war, people thought that Ukraine would be taken within days. But here now, you're actually retaking territory. I mean, do you think there could be a turning point? We all pin our hopes on it. You see, without retaking our territories, there would be no peace. Because what they want is Ukraine in its entirety. They won't stop. And there is no other way but for us to fight back. And can you ever imagine a day where, as some people suggest, there might have to be compromise? Can you ever imagine that? Well, we heard appeals, calls for a compromise from other nations, but I am yet to meet a Ukrainian calling for compromise. It's the Ukrainians' choice to resist. Certainly, you know, the United Kingdom has been very clear in its support for Ukraine. Um, Boris Johnson has tried to take a very strong stance in terms of sports supporting Ukraine. And although he lost his job at home, he's a very popular figure here. What would your message be to our next prime minister? It would be a political statement, which is not my job, not my mission. Just good luck and never forget about humanity. But how important is the connection between the United Kingdom and Ukraine? Do you think there's something special? Extremely important. <laughs> We hear that, we feel that support even emotionally, at the emotional level. When leaders of the United Kingdom demonstrate this support so sincerely and powerfully, we understand that we are not alone, that Brits support their leaders and it inspires us incredibly for fighting. You grew up as a girl in that period of extraordinary change across Eastern Europe, when things were opening up, Ukraine got its independence, I think you were 12 or 13, 12? Yeah, and just this week, Mikhail Gorbachev has passed away. Can you ever imagine a return to seeing that kind of Russia that's looking to the rest of the world to help open up, to come closer to its neighbors rather than to be an aggressor? Well, the tragedy is that the world failed to notice when Russia started to change. For a long time, the world kept believing that Russia was the same as it was in the first years of Gorbachev's era or early Yeltsin Russia. We have a generation of Ukrainians, 30-year-olds, they're adults who never saw the Soviet Union. Ukraine is and will be independent. So there can still be good things in life. And I want to finish by asking you about one of those good things. I have to ask, if you are a fan, and would you come to the Eurovision Song Contest in the United Kingdom if it was possible? <laughs> well, if it were possible, I would love to go. And Ukrainians did want to host Eurovision. It was sort of a bitter feeling when we had to accept the idea, because it would have been not safe. But that's great to know that the United Kingdom is going to host Ukrainians. And are you a fan? Next May, I can't say that I will stay overnight to watch the final, but my daughter, sometimes she likes to watch it in retrospective, the 1970s, the 1980s Eurovisions, and she asks me funny questions, because, you know, those were different performances. <laughs> so lots of ABBA playing in the Zelensky household. Elena Zelensko, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, at the start of the race to become Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak looked like he had it all. He was the early MP's favourite for number 10. After all, he'd lived next door. But unfortunately for him, all indications are that his hopes will be dashed. He's with us now this morning. Welcome to the studio. Now, Liz Truss told us that support was coming for people's energy bills in her first week if she wins. But she wouldn't tell us what. Will you tell us what you would do on day one? Yes, I think this is the most pressing issue facing the country. I've said that from the beginning of the campaign. And that's why I set out a clear plan and a framework for how I would go about 
addressing it and providing support to people. The, there's the three groups of people, that's what I've spelt out, with everybody, because I think everyone is going to need some help given the scale of the challenge. And then two other groups of people who will need further help. That's those on the lowest incomes, about a third of all households in the country, and then the third group of pensioners. Uh, and what I've said I would do is provide direct financial support. I announced some of that as Chancellor. I would go further as Prime Minister as the situation has deteriorated. And we would do that with direct payments using both the welfare system and the system we have to pay pensioners their winter fuel payment over the winter. So how much money would people get on day one or in short order? Yeah, I, it, look, it's, it wouldn't be right or responsible for me mm. to sit here and give you the exact to the pennies and the pound amount. And that's because I'm, I'm not inside. I haven't seen... Mm all the numbers, the nation's finances. But I can tell you what I did previously as mm -hmm. Chancellor to give people a sense of how I approach these problems. Now, look, I'm honest that when you have a situation like this, I don't think you can solve the problem for everybody and it would be wrong to pretend otherwise. But what I've done in the past yeah. is target the most help on the most vulnerable. We... And when we previously thought bills were going to increase by about £1,200 this year, the support that I announced for the most vulnerable roughly was about that same amount. But are we talking about something on the scale of the furlough that you brought in? as Chancellor, something that runs to, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 billion pounds? I, th I think the, the situation is different, uh, for different for a couple of reasons. I think one, you know, remember back then, mm. inflation at one point mm -hmm. went negative, I think, for a month or two, and interest rates were at rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And the situation that the country faces now is one where inflation is high and rising, interest rates are rising. So I think you need to be careful. Mm -hmm. careful. Where you need to, do need to be careful about borrowing because you don't want to make the situation worse, which is why it's so important that the support you do provide is targeted at those who most need it and that this priority, helping people with the cost of living and energy bills, comes above everything else that I might like to do, but I would have to wait until we've dealt with this And you, you are making that argument now, but you were the Chancellor until very recently. Now, the country's finances are not in a happy state, and there seems to be, at the moment, a long-term plan to deal with these energy bills. Do you take responsibility for the predicament that we now find ourselves in? Do you take some of the responsibility? For, well, actually, on public finances, mm. the last time I stood up and, mm -hmm. and did a budget, Actually, the public finances were on a trajectory back to sustainability because of some difficult decisions I made, which but obviously that, have that been a context of debate of, in this, of in this leadership election. Policy. But I, actually, I took the difficult decisions mm -hmm. to restore our public finances to a better place but because on, I think that's important. But on energy, I mean, we've heard Liz Truss talk about the need for a long-term energy yeah. plan. You've now this summer talked about a long-term energy plan, but you were one of the government ministers that doesn't seem to have done very much about it. Do you regret that? Well, actually, actually, in the, if you look at the spending review and the budget, that I've done, we have put significant funding behind new forms of energy, particular things like developing hydrogen, but carbon capture and storage in places like Teesside, for example. So those are actually examples of, of backing this up with action. But I'll tell you what I would like to do going forward, because I think you're right, actually. It's not enough to talk about a sticking plaster, important as mm. it is for this winter. We need a way to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Now, that is about more homegrown energy, but, but it's also about energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. And it's something I talked about on the campaign because there's an opportunity to do something different to what we've done before, help millions of people upgrade the energy efficiency of their homes quite quickly, and that will save them hundreds you, of pounds off their bills and help us reduce emissions. But do you accept that a large part of the reason why we're in this predicament is that the Conservative government over many years failed to come up with a long-term energy plan? Do you wish you'd done more about that? Well, actually, it was previous Conservative government, and before my time, so I can't take any credit for it, that actually made the decision on nuclear power, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a Conservative government yeah, that did that. Yeah, which was taken Again, in 2013, and it's not now um, well, on well, Hinkley, well, that, well, and that's, that's not going to be open until well, 2026 I, 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 at the earliest. I, 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 only, I only got into Parliament in 2015, so... <laughs> and, and look, the offshore wind... I think the offshore wind that we are now all benefiting mm. from, which is now both renewable but also affordable, has come about as the decisions of previous governments, again, before my time. Mm. But look, I can't change the past. All I can do is sit here and tell you what, as Prime Minister, I would do. I've been very clear and detailed about the support I'm going to offer, and who's going to benefit from it, how it's going to be delivered and mm -hmm. when. And I've also been very clear about the longer term plan to improve our that, energy situation. And if there's a political upset, there are always possible, we've learned that in the last few years. If you were Prime Minister, would you plan for blackouts? Would it be right to have some kind of energy rationing to try to stop that happening? Well, what I've said is that we shouldn't rule anything out. I mean, we're facing a genuine emergency. I think anyone pretending that that isn't the situation isn't being straight with the country. And, and by the way, across Europe, 
uh, those plans are being drawn up. And we, I would imagine we should that, prepare for blackouts. Do you? Well, think? as I said, again, I'm, I'm not there. Mm -hmm. I'm not inside. But what I would say is we shouldn't rule anything out because the situation is serious, and we need to make sure that we get through it. And we need to have every tool in the toolbox. And that certainly, as we're seeing in European countries, is certainly one of them. And there, are, look, there are always. Uh, that sounds like that mm. sounds like quite an extreme thing to say when we say yeah. blackouts, but there are probably simpler practical things which are about just conserving the use of energy at a time when we're facing a challenge like this, which should remain a tool in the toolbox. Of course, we don't want to be in that situation, but, but again, it, it would be. I think it's responsible not to rule it out. Um, this is a yes or no question. If people cannot pay their bills, should they be cut off? Well, I do, we want to be in that situation where that doesn't happen. And that's yeah, but it's why, a yes or no. Well, Nobody would I mean, want that I mean, to happen. But... We, we have actually protection for these people. And that's why, as Chancellor, again, I think it was widely acknowledged that what I announced mm. earlier this year, particularly for those on the lowest incomes, did actually provide them with the support they needed. That was independently, I think, almost universally acknowledged. That's my track record on this. I don't want anyone to be in that situation. OK, let's talk about your future. If you don't win, what will you do next? Well, I'm going to stay as a member of parliament. And I was really delighted. Actually, I finished this campaign on Friday uh, at home in Yorkshire with my own members, which was really lovely. And, I, you know, it's been a great privilege to represent them as their member of parliament for Richmond and North Yorkshire. I'd love to keep doing that as long as they'll have me. Let's have, and, a, let's have a quick listen to something you said quite a lot on the campaign. That's the kind of culture that I experienced when I was living in California. Look, I, look, I mean, you heard me talk about my experience in California. Now, we might be teasing a little bit, but there's a lot of chatter in Westminster that actually what you'd like to do would be to go back to America where you had a very successful career. You talked a lot about your experience of California. Will you commit today to staying and standing in the next general election I've, I've, parliament? I, I literally just said I was with my own members. But in the next parliament? Well, I, it's, it's really, it's presumptuous for me to say because I have to get selected by my own members, but I was with them on Friday night and it's been a great privilege to represent them. And I know I can do good work for them. We just, a long running campaign of mine to get more investment in our local hospitals the Friarage, just recently successful. It's going to make an enormous difference to my constituents. So I'm excited to do that. But if I might, actually, because you make the point about California. Yes, I have lived and worked in California. And I actually think it's one of the reasons that I would be good at this job. Because what I will bring to this job mm -hmm. is a way of thinking that is different. And when we think about growth, and in a modern economy, how do you drive growth? You drive it through innovation. Because of my experience, I know how to build that type of and economy, a, and it will benefit and us all. And a yes or no question, Rishi Sunak, if you don't win this time, would you ever run again? Oh, gosh, I, uh, we've just finished this campaign, Laura, so I, I say I, I need to recover from this one. But no, I, I look forward to supporting a Conservative government in whatever so capacity. So that's a yes, you're not ruling it out. No, gosh, no, no, no. I think, I think, I think that, that my job now is to just support a Conservative government. That's what I want to see okay, succeed. OK, we and that's must what leave I'll it do. there. Thank you so much for coming in, especially on our first show. And whatever happens, I hope that you come back again soon. Now, as we come towards the end of the first programme, let's hear again from Liz Truss and from Rishi Sunak. And remember, one of them will be announced tomorrow as our next Prime Minister. I can say, Laura, that I will act. If I'm elected as Prime Minister, I will act immediately on bills and on energy supply, because I think those two things go hand in hand. What I've said I would do is provide direct financial support. I announced some of that as Chancellor. I would go further as Prime Minister as the situation is deteriorated. And we would do that with direct payments using both the welfare system and the system we have to pay pensioners their winter fuel payment over the winter. Now, listening patiently, my guest, Cleo Watson, comedian Joe Lysette, who's about to start his new tour, and Emily Thornbury. Cleo, what do you think is going to happen in the next few days? You've got a lot of experience of Tory government. I mean, I think first I've got hope, which is, and, and I think everyone will agree on the panel, whoever wins, I hope they just completely smash it because we're just in such a dire situation and we need whoever it is to do the best job possible. Um, if we don't get the help that we need, my prediction is... I'll be stowed away on the Artemis rocket by <laughs> Monday. <laughs> I've been in leaky environments, to be honest. So. <laughs> Emily Thornbury, to you, what do you predict? Um, I mean, can I just say, I thought that the interview with Mrs. Uh, Zelenska was really moving, and I do want to assure her that uh, the Britain is absolutely united and we will, st we will give Ukraine steadfast support. That does not mean that we don't need to be looking at how on earth we are going to deal with the energy crisis. We can't blame mm -hmm. the war in Ukraine for all of it because why are our prices going up more than anyone else's? And we do need to have real action. And I'm disappointed that we've yet to hear a proper plan coming from either of these leadership candidates. And Joe, what do you make of what you've heard in the last hour? Well, it was nice to hear from Rishi Sunak. He's not going to be Prime Minister, so you may as well have interviewed Peter Andre. But I would like to see some sort of plan, something concrete 
We need help now. Well, we think very much if Liz Truss wins the Tory leadership election, she's promised she'll come back with that plan in a matter Why not of now? days. It We're not quite now. sure. Well, well, we well, might I've have to wait a little wing. bit longer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Joe Lysette, thank you so very much. Cleo Watson, thank you so very much. And Emily Thornbury from Labour, thank you so very much all for being with us here this morning. Now, as we end our first programme, let's go all the way back to the beginning. We've been trying to answer a key question. What is the new Prime Minister going to do first? The energy crisis is unavoidably at the top of that list. The First Lady of Ukraine told us to remember her country, and they are counting the price in casualties, not in pennies. From Liz Trust this morning, help is coming, and within a week, she promised. I can't help thinking that although she said at the beginning of the leadership campaign that there would be no handouts, that reality has started to bite. The conversation with the public, with all of us, is going to be very different to the conversation that Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have had with their party this summer. Maybe the hard work starts now. Hard work here too. See you here next week or catch up on anything you missed, of course, on the iPlayer. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you here next week, same time, same place. Goodbye.